This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. With Juan Gonzalez, we're broadcasting from the center of the pandemic in New York City. Juan is in New Jersey, the number two state for this pandemic. Hi, Juan. Uh, good day, Amy, and good day to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, today marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, started half a century ago by Wisconsin Senator Gaylord Nelson as a national teaching on the environment. In 1970, more than 20 million Americans participated in that first Earth Day, from coast to coast, 10 percent of the U.S. population at the time. Later that year, Congress established the Environmental Protection Agency and passed landmark laws to protect air and water quality, marine mammals and endangered species. Earth Day looks quite different a half-century later, in the midst of the pandemic, as events and protests planned around the world have moved online. It comes as the Trump administration's gutted fuel economy standards and ease the enforcement of pollution regulations, and the Environmental Protection Agency has implemented its secret science rule that limits the use of studies that don't make their underlying data public. This year's Earth Day also comes in an election year. More than 50 scientists, including prominent climate experts released a letter this week endorsing former Vice President Joe Biden for president, writing, quote, we are confident that, unlike President Trump, Joe Biden will respect, collaborate with and listen to leaders in the scientific community and public health experts to confront the existential climate crisis and other environmental threats, unquote. Last week, Senator Bernie Sanders endorsed Biden with an announcement of plans to form a joint policy task force on climate, and Biden said expanding his climate platform is a, quote, key objective. This comes as Trump promised Tuesday to bail out U.S. fossil fuel producers after an unprecedented collapse in oil markets. Meanwhile, Oxford University has just passed a resolution requiring its endowment fund to divest from fossil fuel companies, and Harvard's president said Tuesday his university would divest from plans to decarbonize its endowment by 2050, which the student group Divest Harvard condemns, saying Harvard's once again standing with fossil fuel companies and against its students' futures. To talk about how far we've come since the first Earth Day 50 years ago and the challenges ahead, we're joined by Bill McKibben from his home in Vermont, author, educator, environmentalist, co-founder of 350.org. In his recent piece for The Nation, he writes, this Earth Day, stop the money pipeline. His piece in The New Yorker magazine asks how we can build a hardier world after the coronavirus. His latest book, Falter, has the human game begun to play itself out. Bill, thanks so much for rejoining us on Democracy Now!, uh, can you talk about the significance of this 50th anniversary of Earth Day and where we stand half a century after that, April 22, 1970? Fifty years ago, as you say, was probably the biggest day of political action in American history. And it came out of the fury over the dirty air and the dirty water that marked our country. People were wearing surgical masks 50 years ago today, too. But they were doing it to protest the almost unbreathable air in many of our cities, uh, the kind of air we now see in places like Beijing and Delhi. Those early warriors uh, we owe a great debt of thanks to because they changed the zeitgeist. And in the wake of that massive show of protest, President Nixon, conservative Republicans, signed the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, everything else, all the acts that Donald Trump is systematically trying to gut. That was a remarkable accomplishment, and our air and water are cleaner. But we didn't make the kind of systemic fundamental changes that we would have needed to head off the much deeper environmental perils that face us now. I mean, in the last 50 years, Amy, the temperature has obviously gone sharply up. We've lost half the sea ice in the summer Arctic. The chemistry of the oceans has changed and changed dramatically. We've lost some of the biggest living things on Earth, the Great Barrier Reef, large parts of our rainforests. Half the wild animals in the world are dead now compared to 40 years ago. Those are remarkable changes that need to be met with remarkable upsurge again in protest and action. And we're seeing some of that, and we're seeing some of it today, albeit online, at this 72 hours of Earth Day on live, uh, live that begins at 9 o'clock on Earth Day morning. 
um, um, it, it's it's a struggle, a, a deeper struggle than we've ever seen before, and the salience of that struggle is highlighted as we deal with the pandemic. What are the messages that come out of this strange moment in human history? One, that reality is real, that you can't hector or fight with or, or, or force to negotiate or compromise uh, chemistry or physics or biology. Both the COVID microbe and the carbon dioxide molecule are immune to political persuasion, no matter how much our president yells at them. If they say, stand six feet apart, we stand six feet apart. If they say, it's time to stop burning coal and gas and oil, then that's what we need to do. Similarly, we're learning lessons about delay and timing here that are crucial. As you know, the countries that flattened the coronavirus curve early on are doing far better than those like ours, which delayed. That's a pretty perfect analog to the 30 years that we've wasted in the climate crisis. And I think third, maybe most powerfully, the lesson that we're learning is social solidarity is almost everything. You know, Amy, this era in our political life began in a sense with Ronald Reagan announcing that the nine scariest words in the English language were, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. But those aren't the scariest words in the English language. The scariest words are, we've run out of ventilators. Uh, the hillside behind your house is caught on fire. And those kind of things we can only face together. So maybe, maybe we we'll see the beginning of the end of this doctrine of every man for himself as we come through this linked uh, uh, and, and uh, Bill, escalating series of crises. Uh, uh, Bill, I wanted to yes. ask you, uh, given the, uh, ironically, uh, this pandemic has led to a situation where the air on Earth is probably cleaner, as I think you've remarked, than at any time in recent memory as a result of so many planes being grounded, so many cars uh, unable to—the uh, to uh, the, the passengers get into them and so much of industry ground to a halt. I'm wondering uh, your thoughts about— how the pandemic is going to affect the battle over climate change in the future? Well, so there are people on Earth, one, who are getting literally their first lungfuls of clean air this month in their lives. And as we worry about the damage, and we must, that comes with coronavirus, we should think also of all the other things that go after our, our lungs. We have 5 million children in Delhi just from breathing the air. So there's def definitely uh, some, some, there's definitely a kind of change sense that even as we all live through the horror of this pandemic, there are people who are glimpsing the way that the world could be. If we all go straight to normal, it, it won't mean very much fun. Bill, looks Bill like. we're going to try to fix your—we're going to try to fix this feed a little better. But I do want to read um, what Trump tweeted again. We said it earlier. He said, we will never let the great U.S. oil and gas industry down. I have instructed the Secretary of Energy and the Secretary of the Treasury to formulate a plan which will make funds available so that these very important companies and jobs will be secured long into the future. Um, can you, Bill McKibben, um, respond to what he is saying right now in the midst of this pandemic? So, the great oil and gas industry has been subsidized for a hundred years with trillions of dollars in taxpayer money. And now there's no demand for its product. And it's being sold wind. So the oil industry is in huge trouble. We saw 
Great news yesterday when Oxford University, most famous university on earth, divested from fossil fuel on the theory that you could never, that it's both immoral and uneconomical. More good news this morning when American University did the same thing here in, in the States. Uh, these are powerful signs. And yes, all they've got left is kind of political juice, and Trump will do everything he can to try and bail them out with our money. But we've got to try and make sure that that doesn't happen, that workers get protected, that we have a just transition for people who, through no fault of their own, are employed in that industry. But it's folly of the highest order to continue subsidizing an industry that, A, is wrecking the planet, and B, no longer makes any economic sense. Bill, I wanted to ask you about your emphasis uh, of late on, on cutting off the money spigot for the fossil fuel industry. There's the announcement recently of Citigroup uh, that they are going to the third largest uh, bank in the United States, that they're going to, uh, from now on, not invest in new coal-fired power plants or oil and gas exploration in the Arctic Circle. Uh, is this movement beginning to have a real impact on the financial underpinnings of the of the fossil fuel industry? Yeah, Juan, it sure is. Um, you know, one of the sadnesses about the pandemic from an organizer point of view is that this movement was cresting, and there would have been today people doing nonviolent civil disobedience, sit-ins, in probably half the 5,000 Chase Bank branches around America. Uh, some of us were arrested at the first of these in January in an effort to kind of launch this thing. Uh, we can't do that, obviously, so people are going online. This Earth Day Live thing is going to be really spectacular. But the the finance arm of the climate fight really has been growing fast in the last year. Probably the biggest victory was getting BlackRock to, uh, uh, well, getting BlackRock to make a series of announcements. This is the biggest asset manager on Earth, really the biggest box of money on the planet, getting them to make a series of announcements about uh, their new climate policies. Now we're monitoring to see if they're serious about it, to see if they're actually doing it. One of the first tests will come next month when Chase Bank, biggest bank in the world, tries to reappoint 81-year-old uh, Lee Raymond to the lead post of lead independent director. He's the guy who ran Exxon for 15 years in the years when it was pioneering corporate climate denial. And now he runs the board of the biggest uh, fossil fuel funder on earth. That's the kind of thing that needs to stop, and we'll see. I mean, this pressure is going to be as unrelenting as we can make it, even amidst a pandemic. And New York City Council, what will it be voting on, Bill McKibben? You just had a virtual news conference with city council members. Yes, Brad Lander and other city council members uh, uh, announced Monday that they were seeking to help cut ties between the city and uh, banks like Chase that don't take climate change seriously. And that's a big deal, because cities do a lot of business with these guys. Remember, Amy, that one difference between, I mean, we've pressured the fossil fuel companies very hard and to great effect, the divestment campaign's the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history now, um, uh, with $14 trillion engaged. But the fossil fuel industry will fight to the last bridge. They only know how to do one thing. If you're a bank like Chase, yeah, you lend them a lot of money, a quarter trillion in the last four years to the fossil fuel industry, but it's still only six or seven percent of your business. So you might change and change fast if you got sufficient pressure, and that's the pressure that people are building now. And the and, live and stream of the three days of celebrations, Bill McKibben, um, in the midst of this pandemic, where can people go? And your final comment on what this pandemic can mean. Arundhati Roy, Roy talks about uh, the pandemic as a portal and how, in the midst of this terrible suffering, um, something can come out um, that makes this world better and safer for everyone. Well, Google Earth Day Live to join this live stream, and then take a moment to reflect um, about the beauty that remains yet on even this hard-pressed world. Um, it is our job, the job of our time on Earth to try and figure out how to slow down and limit the civilization-threatening 
changes that we see going on around us. We're capable of doing it. Engineers have provided us with the gift in the form of sun and wind energy. Let's see if we can come together to take advantage of it. Uh, We better, if we're on the current trends, then 50 years from now, Earth Day won't be a celebration. It will be uh, a funeral. Bill McKibben, we thank you for being with us, author, educator, environmentalist, co-founder of 350.org. We'll link to your pieces in The New Yorker magazine, as well as The Nation. Uh, In it, he writes, this Earth Day, stop the money pipeline. When we come back, Kumi Naidu, the former head of Greenpeace and Amnesty International. Stay with us.